If governments don't completely eliminate fossil fuels by 2040, society is doomed, says Jeff Nesbitt, author of This is the Way the World Ends. That kind of apocalyptic rhetoric costs us trillions, hurts the poor, and fails to fix the planet, says Bjorn Lomborg, the author of False Alarm. Are fossil fuels an imminent threat to human life, or are attempts to eliminate them more destructive? That was the subject of an Oxford-style online Soho Forum debate hosted on Sunday, October 18, 2020. Arguing in favor of the complete elimination of fossil fuels over 20 years was Nesbitt, who's the executive director of Climate Next. He went up against Lomborg, who's the president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. Here's Jeff Nesbitt and Bjorn Lomborg in an online debate moderated by Soho Forum director Gene Epstein. Again, tonight's resolution reads, to combat climate change, the world's leaders must make it their highest priority to completely replace the burning of fossil fuels within the next 20 years. I'll be keeping track of time to debaters and will briefly interrupt each of you to say when you have five minutes left and one minute left. Uh, 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 Jeff, uh, you're first up to defend the resolution. Jane, please close the initial vote and take it away, Jeff. Okay, great. So I wanted to thank you all for, for, for uh, letting me talk to you uh, this evening about meeting the climate moment and why we, um, why I'm arguing with, that we need to go as fast as we can, as as quickly as we can. Um, today, I'm I'm not going to talk about IPCC reports, parts per million of carbon dioxide, two degrees Celsius, climate models, cap and trade schemes, carbon taxes, economic theory, or polar bears. Um, instead, I'm, I'm going to start with my book. It's called This is the Way the World Ends. And I'll just a quick note for those of you who are authors. Um, I did not choose the, the title for this book. My publisher did. I think I'm 0 for 27 with my books in terms of titles for my books. So, um, But I wrote the book to shift the discussion. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to shift the discussion with thought leaders, uh, with the media. I wanted to describe how um, I wanted to describe how climate impacts are happening right now, not, not 50 years from now. So we all, we all see it uh, right now. We see climate change with our own eyes. Hurricanes are stronger and faster. Uh, wildfires are more intense. Extreme flooding is catastrophic. Heat waves are scarier. Ice shelves are melting more. Sea levels and storm surges are rising. And on hurricanes, I, I, I just wanna say this. I'm, uh, I'm not saying there are more of them or, or even that climate change is causing them. What I'm saying is that climate change is making them worse. And the impacts are here right now, not 40 or 50 years from now. They're dramatically affecting water resources across the planet. They're impacting hundreds of millions of species right now. They're driving dangerous geopolitical strategies, which I talk a lot about in my book, and I'll get to those in just a second. They're creating huge climate risks for businesses, insurance companies, and financial groups. Virtually every species on Earth is on the move. Half of all species are experiencing local extinctions right now. And for those who don't know what local extinctions are, it means when a species can't move fast enough, can't migrate fast enough, they go extinct in that part of the world. About 80% of migrating species are doing so because of, quote, physical constraints on their habitats. Extinction rates are 100 times what we might expect. Two thirds of all species on Earth have shifted to earlier spring breeding, migrating, or blooming. Earth's third pole, the, the Himalayas, is under serious duress. Um, the Himalayas, for those who are familiar with it, they're, they're really the engine of the climate system. They're the primary source of water for a billion people. Temperature increases there are now double the global average. Glaciers that took thousands of years to grow are vanishing in just 25 years. And in fact, I, and I talk about this in the book, the Chinese um, just opened up their research that they've had underway in the Himalayas for the last 50 years or so. And hundreds of glaciers in the one small part of the Himalayas they studied have entirely vanished uh, in the past generation. And that's 
Um, so if you extrapolate from there, that means that thousands of smaller glaciers have disappeared entirely. The melting rate for the biggest glaciers is accelerating. It's doubled in just one generation. The world's pollinators are disappearing as well. Um, and that's not good. So climate change is crushing bumblebee species in both North America and Europe. This comes from um, a United Nations uh, a special report with experts on pollinators that they gathered um, on an emergency basis to study what's happening with the pollinators. And what they found is that they've retreated 200 miles from their historic ranges in just a generation. But that still, quite honestly, isn't fast enough. Nearly all of the 20,000 species of pollinators are equally stressed. Hundreds of billions of dollars from our food supply every single year are at risk. So what about climate's evil twin, ocean acidification? For the longest time, the two were not linked. Ocean health, ocean acidification, and climate change up in the atmosphere really were not linked. But folks have started to do that very closely. Um, first of all, oceans are a carbon sink. And second of all, they can actually affect what goes on in the atmosphere. 550 billion tons of carbon dioxide have dissolved in the oceans um, since the, since the uh, pre-industrial revolution times. That's a dangerous change in its chemistry. Oceans have grown 30% more acidic in the past 100 years. That's the fastest change we've ever discovered. We've all heard about the collapse of the great coral reefs. Um, that's been documented uh, quite well. But the last time we saw ocean chemistry changes like this, 55 million years ago during a mass extinction event. And just one final note I'd like to add. Phytoplankton has dropped 6% in 30 years. And as if you know ocean chemistry, phytoplankton is what's dr what drives oxygen um, in the oceans. It's, and it's all, that, that, that level, 6% in 30 years, is already affecting oxygen levels. Meanwhile, the Arctic is changing right before our eyes. I know folks early on in the climate uh, discussion started to focus on polar bears. I'm not talking about polar bears here. Permanent ice, which is known as multi-year ice, has shrunk 20% to just 2% in 30 years. The jet stream has been wobbling for a decade now. Um, and that jet stream wobbling effect affects um, extreme weather events in both North America and, and Europe. The truth, sadly, is this. The Arctic is going through an ecosystem regime change right now. Uh, a big pivotal study that, was, um, that involved a half dozen countries recently found 19 separate ecosystem shifts underway at an unprecedented pace. The Great Green Wall in North Africa, it's, uh, which is, was conceived as literally hundreds of millions of trees around the desert, it won't save the Sahel. Despite that $4 billion pledge to build a wall of trees around the desert, it won't save the nations in around the Sahel. And uh, one caveat, when I started to research my book, I really believed that that pledge would, would help, that you'd have those trees, they would, they, would, they would hold back the desert. The truth is it doesn't. In one example, which I describe in the book, they planted 15 million trees uh, in one of the countries around the, in the Sahel and they died within three months. Um, so that's not gonna solve this problem. Thousands of farms are being swallowed up. Two thirds of Africa's arable land could be lost in just the next 10 years. Half of the world's population now depends on food imports. So all of this has profound implications in that part of the world. Most of us now see what are called domes of heat on a regular basis. Cities in the subtropics, and again, the, um, the subtropics um, is where climate scientists have said for quite some time that we're gonna start to see the most severe impacts from global warming. So right now, cities in the subtropics keep setting records for the hottest temperatures in human history. Record highs outnumber record lows now two to one. That imbalance, uh, you would expect it to be 50, roughly 50-50, is one of the clearest climate signals we have. In fact, meteorologists had to add a new zone for Australia, uh, Australia, a purple zone on top of their existing graphics and charts. Heat waves kill tens of thousands every few years now on a regular basis. Category six hurricanes, and by the way, there is no such thing as a category six hurricane. Um, uh, be, be, it, it's, it, you only go up to category five, but if there were category six hurricanes and, you know, and there were that chart, um, they're just around the corner. In fact, we've probably already seen a few. Hurricanes now intensify much faster and they drop more rain. They're fueled by warmer oceans. 
They're carrying 8% more water circulating in the atmosphere, which, ex which is what uh, drives these extreme precipitation events, uh, which means that some coastal cities are becoming uninsurable right now because of the risk of catastrophic flooding. Water wars have already begun in the subtropics. And I spend a lot of time on this, on the, on the geopolitical implications of climate impacts right now um, throughout the subtropics. Climate scientists, in fact, and environmental groups saw Yemen's civil unrest coming before others did. When the water ran out, the internal wars began. Saudi Arabia has drained its aquifer. It's effectively out of water. And granted, there are multiple reasons for that. They grew wheat when they shouldn't have. They drained the aquifer. They traditionally don't give very much rain, but climate is sits over the top like the 800 pound gorilla and, and, has, and has driven them to this situation. It's one of the reasons, again, why they're buying land for food uh, in places like Arizona. They're, they're scouring for land for food up and down the Nile right now. A multi-year drought in Syria drove farmers off the land and into the cities. That in turn created a political crisis. Water scarcity in Jordan is making the Palestinian refugee problem much worse. Again, I'm not saying that climate change is the cause of that, but it's certainly driving it combined with um, mistakes that they're making on water distribution and how they're dealing with their water infrastructure. Water scarcity also creates instability. The lack of water in Somalia has made it nearly uninhabitable and very dangerous. Pakistan and India have nearly gone to war over water issues in Kashmir. A water war there seems inevitable. In India, there are emerging scientific studies that show the monsoon might become unstable. That will affect a billion people. And because of the situation with the Gobi Desert, China is now buying virtually every soybean on the planet. These are some of the geopolitical stories I talk about in my book. And I want to be clear about this. These are very real costs. They are affecting much more than just a small fraction of the global economy right now. But there is some good news in, in all of this. We have a blueprint. We'll need $90 trillion in new infrastructure in the next 15 years. This is going to happen whether we have a climate and clean energy strategy or not. And I'll add, this build out isn't based on hypothetical economic theories. It's based on need. We have two political conversations going on right now. They're on parallel tracks. Environmentalists focus on climate change. The business and investment community focuses on energy and cost. I've been arguing for years that we need just one conversation. And to really make this work, we need a transition. We have to go from green to blue. We need to change the paradigm from green or save the planet to blue, which effectively means save humanity. We have the technological communications and science capacity. World output has doubled since 1980. Hundreds of millions have been lifted out of poverty, but two and a half billion people still live on less than $2 a day. They're the energy poor. And I'll say this right now, of course, we should focus on their needs. We also need to recognize this. The age of fossil fuels is coming to an end. We have the technological capacity to replace fossil fuels for electricity and cars within 15 years. Microgrids and battery storage can power the energy, energy needs for the energy poor. Utility companies are choosing renewable energy over natural gas right now. Transportation companies are placing similar bets and they're not betting on fossil fuels. So are major financial institutions. They finally see both the climate risks and economic opportunity. A renewable energy future is in reach right now. Wind, sunlight, and water sources are 55 times what we need each year by 2030, 10 years from now. Analysts say we'll need 17 terawatts of energy in the year 2030. We have 667 terawatts of available solar, wind, and water energy right now. Utilities five minutes. Five minutes. Utility scale solar. Thanks, Gene. Utility yeah. scale solar and wind energy is now cost competitive. It'll be the cheapest new build in, within five years. Electric vehicles are also at that inflection point. It's why California just banned gas-powered cars by 2035. Others will follow. And I'd like to say this emphatically, while I'm not, while I'm certainly not opposed to it, we do not need breakthrough technology. We don't need to research this for 30 years. We just need to deploy what we have now. And I'll tell you, China gets it. They're racing toward a clean energy future. China has said they'll peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030. They see a major dis disruption of current electric power and car business models by 2030. China's doubling its renewable energy capacity each year now. It'll add more generating capacity for renewals, renewables by 2035 than the United States, Europe, and Japan combined. Because of this, clean energy solutions will 
they'll receive two thirds of the five trillion dollars invested in new power plants in the next 10 years. So if you don't believe that change can happen very quickly, I, I want you to think about this. Google and Amazon incorporated in 1995. Both of them had upended established industries within 15 years. Google offered the New York Times a 25% stake early on. The New York Times said no. They didn't see the internet threatening publishing. Tech industry titans like Facebook, Google, and Amazon now dominate the global economy, and it took less than 20 years. A clean energy economy is truly the next big thing, and the analysts see it. Energy exploration and cheap power drove the global economy in the 19th century. The tech industry drove it in the 20th. I would argue clean energy is poised to be the 21st century's economic opportunity. And no one, honestly, wants to be the next Blockbuster or Sears or Toys R Us, Borders, Minolta, or um, Kodak. The truth is decarbonizing the economy will create jobs. There's a recent report by a group called Rewiring America that shows electrifying everything in America by 2035, that's 15 years from now, creates 25 million jobs. Electrifying everything would also save the average family $2,000 a year in energy costs. All 50 states in America can transition to 90% clean energy in just 15 years with no additional consumer costs. It's why clean energy jobs are growing nearly twice as fast as any other sector sector in America. Even the oil and gas majors now clearly see this, uh, see that they see this future. BP just announced it'll increase its low carbon business investment tenfold in the next decade. It'll increase its investments in this area $5 billion a year, and it will immediately shrink its oil and gas production by 40%. So do other oil and gas majors. Royal Dutch Shell, ENI of Italy, Total of France, Repsol of Spain, Equinor of Norway, all 10 year targets which leaves Exxon and Mobil and, Sh and Chevron to fight for oil for the next 20 to 30 years. So I'll, I'll say right off the bat that it's true, it could take 20 years to switch out a billion internal combustion engine cars, but the electric vehicle trend is accelerating and it's impossible to ignore. Tesla's battery that might last a million years and cars that compete on price are obvious examples. And Volkswagen is clearly becoming an electric vehicle company now, so are others. Meanwhile, the age of electric cars is dawning ahead of schedule. Battery prices are dropping much faster than analysts expected, 80% in just 12 years. Analysts also say electric vehicles won't need government incentives in the near future. VW's ID3, same price as a Golf. Tesla Model 3, same as a BMW 3 Series. China's Neo company sees par price parity in just three years by 2023. And when electric vehicle prices match internal combustion engine sticker prices across the board, the race to switch is on. So I'll predict this. Renewable energy will win the fight with fossil fuels in less than 20 years. Berkeley had a, had a 2035 grid study that shows all 50 states in America can reach 90% renewable minute, power in just 15 years. The Rockefeller Foundation has a microgrid solution to solve India's cheap power needs. Even the airline industry is decarbonizing. Airbus will have zero carbon prices. Um, zero carbon planes within 15 years. The world's Fortune 500 companies see it as well. Facebook, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Unilever all have 2030 targets. Others are moving even faster. The U.S. Commodities Future Trading, uh, Trading Commission has a new report that sees climate risks. And this is what financial institutions are finally seeing. Chase, Morgan Stanley, BlackRock, Bank of America, Citibank, all are looking to invest hundreds of billions of dollars to look at climate risk transparency, or to uh, study their emissions. Even huge numbers of Americans want to act right now, two thirds across the board. They want 100% clean energy, they want Congress to act, they want climate policies to spur innovation, they want a multi-trillion dollar stimulus, and they even want to retrain workers in fossil fuel industries who lose their jobs. So to closing, we have a choice. A clean energy future is within our grasp. We have the technology, the investment incentives, and the political will. There's no reason at all to rely on fossil fuels uh, for much longer. Disruptive energy sector changes can clearly happen on 20 year time horizons. And the clean energy transition designed to meet this climate moment will be no different. And I'm certain we can meet that challenge. And then one last uh, set of slides. Jeff, you have about 50 sec 30 seconds in the hole. But All right. Please, please but I just want to show these just really quickly. This is okay. Fifth Avenue yes, at the yes, turn yes, of this. Yes. yes. This is Fifth Avenue in New York during the mm -hmm. Easter parade at the turn of this 20th century. The parade was all horse-drawn carriages. Ten years later, same, same Easter parade, same Fifth Avenue. They were all cars. Change can occur that rapidly. Thanks. 
All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, uh, Bjorn, I'm going to give you uh, an extra 45 seconds uh, to match uh, Jeff's, uh, and hopefully you'll make the most of those extra 45 seconds. Uh, uh, speaking for the negative, uh, Bjorn Lundberg, take it away, Bjorn. Good. Uh, and Jeff, thanks a lot for your presentation. I'm very glad that it also took a little bit of time to get your slides up and running. So <laughs> now I can uh, now I can fumble around as well. So yeah, look, can, can I can just say by the way, I got, I got dinged at the start. So so you know so uh, for, for taking time to set it up. Just I just just wanted to say that. So yeah, ahead. you guys, you guys <laughs> ahead, are Bjorn. great. You guys go ahead, are great, uh, Jeff. Let let Bjorn spiel on. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Hey, yeah. thank you guys. Yeah. So look. First of all, uh, let's and and uh, you know I, I had to prepare these slides before I knew what Jeff was going to talk about. So let me just uh, most of it is going to address directly what Jeff talks about. Uh, but let's just get this out of the way. Climate change is real; it's man-made; it is a problem. So our conversation really here is a question of policy. So the question is: Should we eliminate fossil fuels in twenty years? And to answer that, I think we need to look at a few key points. So let me just summarize what I'm going to go through here. The first one, of course, is how big is the challenge of climate change? Jeff's presentation makes you believe, my God, this is really sort of end of the world kind of stuff. That's not the correct answer. It's a moderate problem in the world of problems, big and small. It is an issue. It's not the end of the world. And that, of course, matters in the terms of how much are we willing to spend on this. Then the second question is, how much good will this end fossil fuels in 20 years do? How much good will it actually produce? I will show you the evidence from the UN Climate Panel that indicates that this will do some good. Roughly, if we adjust it towards the global GDP, it will roughly be equivalent to each one of us becoming about 2% better off. Remember, when I'm measuring this in GDP, it doesn't mean that everything is measurable in GDP. It simply means it gives us an understanding of what is the size of this when you try to incorporate all the different challenges, many of them non-markets, many of them you know, disappearing wetlands, and many other problems. So also, how much bad will this proposed policy do? Because obviously it has cost, and I'll get back to that because Jeff sort of alluded to, maybe it won't cost money at all, it will. But how much will it cost? Well, turns out that it will have quite a lot of cost, likely around 16% of GDP. Now, spending 16% of GDP to avoid 2% cost is a bad deal. That's the fundamental reason why this is a very bad proposal. This does not mean we should not be focusing on, and I'm a little surprised that my, um, my clicker doesn't work anymore. Um, Oops. This is what I, this is the kind of thing that you don't want to see. Apparently my, uh, my computer just decided to uh, halt. So overall, more bad than good. And we should still do climate policy and I'll get back to that, but we should do it smartly. I'm not sure, uh, my computer seems to be freezing up a little bit. Anyway, so how big of a problem? Let me go through these three points that I tried to make. So the first one is, what is the big environmental problems? Let's just take a look at the, uh, how, how is the world's most deadliest environmental problems? A lot of people would tend to believe that that's global warming. They would be very, very wrong. So very clearly, some of the biggest problems is indoor and outdoor air pollution, which is only marginally related to fossil fuel use. It's about 20% that comes from fossil fuel use. Unsafe water, lead, unsafe sanitation, hand washing, ozone. Only then comes global warming at about 140,000. This is the World Health Organization estimate from 2020, the rest of the global burden of disease. 2019, yes, global warming will in 2050 be a little higher up to about 250,000, but it'll still be much, much smaller. So it's important to have a sense of proportion. Yes, global warming is a problem. By no means, it's not the most important environmental problem. It is indeed not the world's biggest problem by any standard. Of course, the biggest problem in the world is arguably poverty, which kills about a third of all people that die every year. So again, we need to get a sense of proportion. This does not make global warming unimportant, but it makes it very important that we don't overfocus on global warming to the detriment of all the other challenges that we face. This is also why when the UN asked the world, this is the biggest uh, survey that we've had, they asked 
about 10 million people, what are your top priorities? This is the answer that people across, across the world gave us. They told us it's education, health, jobs, corruption, nutrition, whereas action on climate change came out at the very bottom of 16 of 16. Again, we're an advanced civilization. It doesn't mean we can't do many things at once, but it's important that we don't overfocus on global warming. Uh, and again, then why do we know how big of an impact global warming has? Well, we do that because climate economics have been spending the last 30 years. Uh, this is from the last UN report in 2014. It's also from the only climate economist who got the Nobel Prize, Nordhaus, Will Nordhaus at Yale, uh, who's done these estimates. Uh, and again, I'm sorry, it looks like uh, it shifted a little bit because I just moved it to another computer, but there you are. It's roughly true. <laughs> so what it shows is as, te as, as temperatures get higher and higher, you get more and more negative impact on the world. Uh, this is Nordhaus' best estimate of what the total damage cost does. What it tells you is at a realistic impact, we're going to see somewhere between two and four percent of total global decline in GDP from global warming. That is a problem, but again, not by any means the end of the world. And this is not just Nordhaus model. This is also uh, what the PAGE and the fund model shows. These are the three models that the Obama administration used as its foundation to make uh, an estimate for the social cost of carbon. So if we have this set up and we hear that global warming is going to cost us a couple percent, but not this end of the world stuff. You got to ask yourself, why is it that I hear something entirely different in the news? And you also heard that from Nesbitt's uh, presentation just a little while ago. Well, the answer is that we often hear the story without adaptation. Let me just show you this one study, but there's many, many, many of these studies. If we look at flooding, that was one of the things that Jeff mentioned. Uh, flooding right now is estimated to cost about 3.4 million people being flooded. The cost is about $11 billion in cost at $13 billion in dike cost per year. That leads to a total cost of 0.05% of global GDP from flood cost. That's not as big as I think you might have imagined, but it's not trivial. However, if you then look at a world that is going to be much warmer, that will have much higher population and much higher cost. What will happen as sea levels rise? This is the typical answer that you hear, that because we do not adapt, you will actually have huge costs. You will see a, a, a situation where 187 million people are going to get flooded every year. It'll have a cost of $55 trillion. Uh, this is the typical argument that you hear with no adaptation, 5% of global GDP, a hundredfold increase in costs. But what that neglect, of course, is that we will adapt. All of these models assume that we will adapt. And this is what you actually see if we adapt. We will see fewer people flooded. We will see higher costs, yes, but that's mostly because we're richer. We'll also see much higher cost from uh, dike cost. But overall, the total cost and proportion of GDP will actually decline almost tenfold. What that tells you is that you hear stories that are very, very good for headlines, that get great amounts of attention, but that are not realistic. Global warming, again, is a problem. It would be a disaster if we did nothing to, uh, towards it, but it's not going to be a disaster because nobody imagines that we're going to do nothing about it. That's why global warming is a moderate problem. And then one we need to ask, well, how much is it going to cost us to actually tackle it? So how much good will we get from this proposed policy uh, proposal? Well, we know that many of the policies that you think will have a lot of impact actually will do fairly little. Even extreme policies like uh, all of the rich world stop all their CO2 emissions tomorrow. If you run that through the UN climate panel model, it will reduce temperatures by the end of the century by just 0.8 degree Fahrenheit, much less than what most people would probably imagine. So how much good will this cost? Well, ending fossil fuels in 20 years will likely land us around two degrees centigrade. Uh, we know how much good that will do because the UN Climate Panel report from 2018 actually very specifically tells us if we do nothing, it will cost the world, it will cost further damages of 2.6%. If we get to two degrees, it'll get us to 0.5% instead. So doing nothing will cost damage worth 2.6%. Ending fossil fuels in 20 years will cost damage worth 0.5%. So the benefit will be to avoid 2.1% of GDP damages. That's the simple answer to what's the cost, what's the benefit. But there'll also be a cost. Of course, there's a cost. And here, I think we need to address head on uh, something that Jeff also uh, uh, seems to uh, indicate that 
oh my God, this is going to be cheap. Well, no. Uh, across Europe, we've seen that the more renewable energy you put in, the higher the cost. This is not because individual solar panels are not cheaper. They are much cheaper now than they used to be, and they're possibly even cheaper than new fossil fuels. But of course, it's only cheaper when the sun is shining. When the sun is not shining, it's actually infinitely costly. And that's why you can't actually easily supply the world with renewable energy. That's also why when the UN climate panel did their modeling, they found that of 128 models, all 128 models had real cost. So the story that you often hear is a standard, slightly schizophrenic story. On the one hand, renewables will inevitably take over as they get cheaper. And on the other hand, that this is going to be a Herculean World War II sort of mobilization kind of effort. I think uh, actually that Jeff landed most in the top one, that this is going to be cheap. We don't even need to have this conversation. Then, of course, I wonder why we're having this debate, because then we don't need to decide anything. It's just going to happen. There's a little bit of truth and a lot of misdirection in that argument. No, this is going to be phenomenally expensive, and I'll show you why. We do have estimates, not for how much this is going to cost, but we do have reasonable estimates of some policy estimates that are close to this. So let me just show you how absurd this proposal that we're going to stop in, in 20 years. Uh, let me go back to 1800, uh, when in 1800, we got almost all of the world's energy from renewable energy and 94%. We've spent the last 170 years getting rid of renewables. And for the last 50 years, we've stayed pretty stably at about 13 to 14%. This is mostly uh, developing countries using bad fuels like wood, dung, cardboard inside their homes to cook and keep warm. Even today, we're at 14% renewables. If we look at the Paris Agreement, this is the International Energy Agency. If we totally fulfill Paris, we'll get almost to 20%, more realistically, to about 16%. If you look at all the UN uh, uh, basic scenarios, they have five scenarios, we will, in the very best scenario, get to 45% by the end of the century. So this is important to get a sense of proportion. Over the last 300, sorry, last 200 years and the next 100 years, we're basically likely to get rid of fossil fuels and in the very best case, maybe get back to 50%. However, what Jeff wants you to do is to do this, go from about 14% today to 100% in two decades. This is not going to happen. But if we try to estimate how much is this going to cost, it is going to be phenomenally costly. We don't know exactly how much because there's literally nobody has ever costed such an extreme policy. But there are two other studies that do indicate what the cost is. To get 80% below uh, 1990 levels by 2050, so a longer timeline and less ambitious timeline will cost somewhere between 5 and 10% of GDP every year. Uh, to get to 100% to, by 2050, so the 100% that Jeff proposes, but further down the line for New Zealand, will cost somewhere between 13, 16 and 32% of GDP. So it's realistic that this will be very costly, and of course, it will fail to get implemented for a very simple reason. Remember the Washington Post last year uh, asked people, and we have many of these surveys, uh, they found that uh, two thirds of all Americans think that global warming is really important. And if you ask them, as, as Jeff uh, uh, posed the question, do you want a, a, a trillion dollar uh, 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 green package? They'll say yes. But if you actually ask them, will you pay for it? They'll say no. More than half of the US population weren't willing to spend $24 a year. Remember, the uh, uh, Biden climate package is going to cost about $1,500 per person in the US. And of course, getting these 16% uh, uh, these, uh, of GDP, uh, even just 5% of GDP in, in the US by 2050 will cost about $12,500 per minutes, person per minutes. year. Yeah. Thank you. So no, this is not going to happen. And that's, of course, why we need to recognize, look, the cost of the policy ending fossil fuels will vastly be outweighed, will vastly outweigh its benefits. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything. It means we should start tackling climate change smartly. And so let me just very briefly say what we should be doing. 
we should have a realistic carbon tax. I know that Jeff has talked about $40 per ton. Uh, I probably think that's a little optimistic, but let's just go with that. But that's certainly not going to solve all the problem. We should also look at adaptation. And mostly, we should look at lots of green innovation. I'm sure that's one of the places we're going to be discussing. Jeff told you, we have all the technology we need. No, we don't. Uh, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, Bill Gates famously said that we, uh, we're short about two dozen great innovations to get there. Uh, that's why we uh, and my organization has been arguing for a long time we should be spending about $100 billion on research and development into green energy every year. The world spends about $20 billion right now, so that's a five-fold increase. That would help enormously because the trick here is to make sure that we actually get green energy be so cheap that everyone will want to switch rather than right now as we have to do twist everybody's arm to get a little bit of reduction in CO2 emissions. But let's not do the dumb stuff. And that is this proposal. Ending fossil fuels in 20 years is a spectacularly wasteful way of helping a little. It'll likely fail. It will make us ignore the policies that will fix climate when we're so focused on getting all of our fossil fuels out and get renewables in, we forget to invest in innovation, we forget to invest in a carbon tax, which we've seen fail most places around the world, we forget to focus on adaptation. But it also means that we ignore the solutions that for most people around the world matter a lot more. The ones that matter much more, the ones that help much more, the ones that help much faster and help at a much lower cost, like for instance, education, nutrition, and health. So the fundamental point here that I'm trying to make is simply to make us realize, yes, global warming is a real problem. It's a moderate problem. We should make smart policies, but we should not, please not, make the policies that will make us incredibly much worse off and that will also fail and that will make us forget all the other issues that we really need to focus on. So thank you very much. I'm looking very much forward to a great conversation with you, Jeff, and all the questions from the audience. Thank you, Bjorn. Uh, we now go to the rebuttal part of the debate. Uh, five minutes for you, Jeff, uh, to rebut. Take it away, Jeff. So um, first, I just wanted to say um, at, at the opening, hey, I, I, I enjoyed the presentation, Bjorn. You are, you are clearly a statistician. Um, you uh, chart after chart after chart, lots of statistics. Um, so I, I, I enjoyed that. So um, I also want to say very quickly, I, I, even though I say we don't need to have innovation, I am a big fan of innovation. I'm a big fan of R&D. I mean, I spent years of my life, the National Science Foundation and first in the Bush administration, then the Obama administration. Um, I clearly believe that lots more research and innovation can only help. So, so I want to get that out of the way. I also want to say that I, look, I, my organization helped launch the Climate Leadership Council, which advocates for a $40 carbon tax. We've put out the statements from hundreds of economists. I'd love to see a carbon tax. Uh, I just don't think it's politically realistic. I don't think it's, it's clearly not feasible in the United States. Um, and finally, there's no question that we're going to have to adapt. I, th th I think that's obvious that we're going to have to adapt. So where this sort of boils down to is, uh, as I view this, Bjorn is arguing this is a moderate problem, maybe not so big a problem. I'm saying clearly it is a big problem. It has interlocking um, whipsaw uh, impacts across the board on other things. But I will also say this, I just want to point, you know, my son runs a global public health organization that is working on the front lines with, with community health workers. My wife is a physical therapist. My daughter is a physician, works in, 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 in medical poverty. Um, my son is a lawyer uh, who represents migrant workers. There are lots of big problems. And so I just want to just put that out there. I'm not saying there aren't other big problems. So what it boils down to is one, is, cl is climate change a bigger, uh, you know, a big problem as I'm arguing or a moderate or non-existing problem as Bjorn's arguing or, or and is there going to be ex exorbitant costs? So let's go to the cost equation. So uh, you know, I, I know Bjorn, you're a big fan of William Nordhaus, his dice theory. I, I get it. He says that GDP costs are huge, enormous, but there's another Nobel Prize winning economist for economic science, Joseph Stiglitz. He and Nick Stern had their own panel, and they, which was supported by the World Bank, where he was the chief economist. He says that isn't true at all. Climate goals can be achieved with a moderate price. 
well within the range of what global uh, the global economy absorbs from variable energy prices. Now, I'll be the first one to admit I'm not an economist. Um, I would let Joseph Stiglitz argue that as opposed to me. I'm a writer and a journalist who interviews folks and and, and you know pulls that away from that. Nordhaus also, in, in my opinion, and others that I've talked to, severely underestimates the damage from climate change. Climate impacts, as I, as I think I've tried to show and I've written about in my book that are cited by hundreds of studies aren't limited to just a few outdoor places. So the impact that it's somehow only going to be two, three, four percent is not true. You know, you just look at things like acidification, rising sea levels, storm surges, water scarcity in the subtropics, food insecurity, biodiversity changes that create pandemics. I'm not saying that climate change causes these, but they're clearly interlocked with them. That's a lot of impact across the board. And so I think how we, how we, how we, how we disaggregate this, the climate change, pure climate change impacts with these whipsaw effects, I think is important to understand. I'll also say that climate change fuels extreme events. There, there's lots of attribution study this, studies in the scientific literature that's now starting to show this. Um, and I will also say in terms of GDP loss, just in one year alone in 2017, the United States lost one and a half percent of its GDP um, from these extreme events. And again, I can, you know, just anticipating where you're going to come at, at this, Bjorn. I'm not saying that these hurricanes or these extreme events are caused by climate change, and that's the sole reason for the property and loss of life, but they're clearly interlocked. And so the question is, how much are they responsible for it? I think, I think we can have a reasonable debate about that. The arguments, I would also, that your arguments, they really don't take into what's known as tail risk. And somebody I've learned from, Hank Paulson, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, his risky, risky business report uh, was issued out of my own organization. Hank uh, also wrote an op-ed for the New York Times where he talks about this tail risk. He calls it a, a, a climate risk bubble. Again, this is Hank Paulson who, 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 who laid out, who helped save the United States economy coming out of a recession. So I think you would want to take it seriously when a guy like Hank Paulson, a, a Republican tr Treasury Secretary says, tail risk and climate risk bubbles are real. We need to pay very close attention to it. Um, that's what I do. So I, 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 I take that. And finally, I'll just say, um, I don't think it's right for us to ignore or discount the environmental and social societal impact of climate change on future generations. So I'm uneasy with talking about, about costs now um, and benefits for, for, for generations in the future, um, that somehow we can incur costs now uh, for benefits in the, in the future. And I'll just say, I know this is a terrible analogy, but I'll just, it's, it's, I'll just use it anyway. I have three kids. We, my wife and I paid for their college education. That's a cost right now for a future benefit. It's a pretty simple equation. I think that we can do that as a society as well. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, five minutes uh, for you, uh, Bjorn, take it away. Thank you. So Jeff, uh, thank you very much. And I also enjoyed your uh, presentation a lot. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right that we should you know, really boil this conversation down uh, to the two questions of, is this a big problem? Uh, I, I, you, you somehow mentioned that I was almost suggesting that it's not a problem at all. That's not what I'm saying, right? But that it's a more moderate problem, uh, which I think uh, uh, the overwhelming literature and certainly also the UN Climate Panel tells us that it is. Uh, but I think much more importantly, so you were talking about, is there going to be an exorbitant cost? Um, I think it's important to recognize that none of the policies that we've done so far have come out cheaper they've come out much more expensively. So the EU 2020 policy, which is the best uh, study policy that we can now see how much it cost, it was, the EU said it would cost 0.5% of GDP. Uh, the uh, the uh, big climate models that came out of the uh, Stanford Energy Modeling Forum uh, showed that it would cost about 1% of GDP. Uh, but unfortunately, the EU decided to implement it in a rather foolish way, uh, as politicians often like to do, uh, which ended up costing about 2% of GDP. Now, it's important to recognize that none of these will bring the EU to the poorhouse. And so I think your point is right in saying, of course, we can do this. We can spend 16% you know, of GDP. And remember, by 2050, and especially by 2100, we will be much, much richer. So again, uh, to go to your, uh, your college analogy for your kids, uh, clearly, you want to leave your kids with smart stuff. Uh, and, and generationally, one of the things that we found is one of the best ways to leave your kids and future generations is through knowledge and through uh, a technology of resources. So basically, make sure that kids 
or, or the next generation have lots of resources, lots of knowledge that they will be able to figure out the problems that will come in the next generations, the next two generations. But let's just make sure that we actually do that. You gave the, your kids a college education. I'm pretty sure if you were the weird a dad who had decided to invest all of his money in, I don't know, model trains. You, you, you went first with a bad analogy, so I can just go on <laughs> <laughs> along with that. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure they'd be pretty annoyed if you'd given them all your resources and model trains and you'd be like all excited about it. The point is, of course, we should make sure we leave our kids and future generations with really good stuff. It's very hard to know what is good stuff in a hundred years. Uh, you showed the uh, the uh, May Day, uh, sorry, East, May East, 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 yeah, May East, East Parade, Parade. Uh, yes. from, from New York. Remember, you see switches very, very quickly when there's an obvious benefit to individuals. One of the big problems with climate policy is that there's no obvious individual benefit. If we really get the climate revolution right, sorry, if we get the energy revolution right, you will get exactly the same out of your plugs as you used to get, namely stable, cheap electric power. At the very best, it'll just feel like nothing changed. At worst, of course, it'll feel like, oh my God, I only get it when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, which I think nobody really wants. So the point here is it's a very different technology transition. It's only one that is driven by cost. There's no other great thing. You wanted a, a car rather than a horse because it was cheaper, it was better in so many different ways. You want it to switch to Google because it was so much better than using the library. You want it to switch to a cell phone because it was so much better than waiting at, at, at a wide phone and all these other things. Most innovations have been great because they changed something. We're actually talking about making an innovation that will change nothing. And that's why this is going to be about cost. And I think we can't really ignore the fact that all of these studies, so the UN Climate Panel very clearly tells us that all of these impacts will have costs. Yes, we'll get uh, uh, jobs, but you get jobs no matter what you do. The point is you get jobs when you have someone doing productive stuff, but you don't get much minute, welfare if you do unproductive stuff. Thank you very much. Oh, so the... Sorry, did you say one minute? Oh, yes, 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 yeah, yes, one minute. Yes, good, great. So fundamentally, you, you're right. We're basically down to, is this the end of the world? And I understand why a lot of people will present it as the end of the world, both it's a much easier and much more nicer story to tell. It also makes it much easier to say, we got to spend anything. You know, obviously if this was an asteroid hurtling towards earth, we should spend everything. We should send, you know, Bruce Willis up there and fix it. Um, and that only works for people of the older generation, right? But the, but the point is, it is not such a thing. It is a problem. And unfortunately, your solution, the 20 year uh, solution of, of going entirely fossil free is not only, I think, absolutely unrealistic, but if we try to do it, it'd be phenomenally expensive. And there's no good reason to believe that that is not exactly what that will happen. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. All right, we now go to the Q and A portion of the evening. We have questions that came in from the audience. And the first rule of Q&A is that uh, any, uh, either of the debaters at any time have uh, the prerogative to ask the other a question. And uh, I'll begin by asking if you want to exercise that prerogative now or wait for questions. Uh, Jeff, would you like to pose a question to Bjorn at this moment or waive the opportunity until later? Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions I'd, asked, I'd like to ask Bjorn. Uh, do I just go get ahead. one or? Yeah. Okay, ask, the first is that's the first, and then we'll get to the second. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, first, Bjorn, you talk about about the, the the you know about that if 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 the rich world, which we're talking about, the EU and the United States and, and several others, if they act, it's still not going to have enough of an impact. Well, of course that's true. I mean, it, it you know, but that's not what we're talking about. The Paris Climate Agreement was every country in the world. China has committed to to. To doing things, if, if China alone acts, that's seventeen percent of the problem. So, and India is all a bigger. So, so my question is, is that fair to just focus on if the rich world acts and the rest of the world doesn't? Is that a, is that a fair way to address impacts? Yeah, yeah, and and it's a good question. Uh, look, I think it, it's worthwhile because we have this conversation in the rich world. It mostly is the rich world conversation. It mostly is in the rich world there where there's 
conversation about actually going actively uh, net zero by 2050. You're right that China, I think, mostly strategically have uh, come out and said that they want to peak in 2030 and that they want to uh, go carbon neutral in 2060. Uh, if you read their document, they also promise that they'll go democratic by 2050. So I think it gives us a sense of what we can realistically expect. Uh, I think it depends a lot on what will happen in, in the far future. Uh, if we manage to innovate the prices of green energy down below fossil fuels, and we also have a way to make sure that that just doesn't work when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing, which either mean batteries, it means much better biomass right now. Biomass, I think, is a terrible choice, uh, but it could become uh, a really good choice. Uh, or nuclear power or, uh, or, or fusion. There are many other ways that we can imagine this. But if some of these things come true, of course, everybody is going to jump on the, on the bandwagon. You mentioned, for instance, electric cars. Uh, I think uh, many people are going to switch to electric cars over the next 10 years. Uh, we should also just have a sense of proportion of what that's going to do. So the International Energy Agency estimates that if we actually successfully manage to get to uh, 360 million uh, electric cars, so about a third uh, by 2030, it will reduce carbon emissions by about 1%. This is a very small part of the solution, and it's the easy one. And it's not going to solve transportation needs in general. It's going to solve a rather niche problem. It's a great thing. I, I, I love the fact that it's happening. I hate the fact that we're right now spending $10,000 in subsidies on each electric car. Uh, we should not be doing that. Uh, well, the U.S. is spending, what, 7500 7, in California. In California, you also give a top up. Uh, so I think it becomes 10000 right? Many other countries, they're spending about, you know, somewhere between uh, six and $10,000. That's a terrible idea. But again, innovations can come. And, you know, the electric car for some parts is going to be a great innovation and great that'll happen but this only shows that's the kind of solution that we need in a lot of different areas sorry i think i meandered What's, a little bit uh, away from your, okay. from your I, I, question jeff, okay i'll hold you a second question jeff i want to okay. i want to put the ball back in uh mm -hmm. to jeff's uh, into bjorn's court uh do you have a question for jeff if you want to wave it I, I think it's much more fun to hear the audience questions. Okay. I hope we might be able to get back to uh, questions to each other, but we'll be, I, I think we'll, we want to get others we'll, in. We'll be getting to audience questions, but Jeff has a second question for you. Uh, I do, and I, yeah, and I actually think it, it's it's just in line with what, what you were just talking about, Bjorn. So I very quickly, a bit of a backdrop. So when uh, the, the U.S. economy was collapsing, I was at the National Science Foundation. I was their chief lobbyist and their chief public affairs official. It was my job to try to to... to pull money from the Recovery Act. So I was able to successfully lobby for $3 billion for the National Science Foundation to fund, you know, spectacular R&D. Well, one of the biggest bets was on battery storage, a billion dollar bet on battery storage. This was back in 2009. So I think I would encourage you to sort of update the way you think about this, because the truth is that big bet in R&D, which you're a fan of, way back then is now paying dividends. You now see this, this question of when the sun is shining or whatever, that's no longer really an issue anymore. Thanks to R&D that has really accelerated along with other things like microgrid uh, storage solutions and other things. So my question to you is if that were solved, if R&D were to solve this problem, would you worry so much about, about solar and wind? Uh, no, uh, but you're unfortunately not very. I'm. I'm very happy you got a billion dollars for batteries. Uh, but I think you. Uh, you. You're entirely missing the scale of the problem. I'm sure you. You actually know this. Uh, but right now, there's batteries enough in the whole of the U.S. to cover 14 seconds of U.S. electricity consumption, average U.S. electricity consumption. So no, we're nowhere near being able to fix this. And and the real reason I think a lot of people fail to get this, um, the real reason why solar and wind cannot actually uh, uphold and end up making the, the grid much more expensive is because all solar especially comes at the same time. This is also true, but slightly less uh, uh, true for, for wind. But if you look at all solar, it all comes around midday. That's great for the first couple percent of energy because typically in most countries, uh, noon is about the, the, the peak time. So it actually eats into the peak time, which is some of the most expensive production of electricity. So it actually helps a country. But what very quickly happens 
is that it starts eating into the revenue of all the other producers. You end up with an enormous glut of electricity. So when you when you hear countries, for instance, going, uh, uh, you know, typically for the first for the first time, oh, we've just produced 100% of electricity uh, uh, for a country. What you never hear is, and the price went negative. Uh, it's actually worth nothing because you can't sell this at any other time. So what you end up with is you're selling a lot of electricity at very low cost, and then you have to get the rest of the cost covered for the non-solar and non-wind by much, much higher cost electricity that's produced elsewhere, which is why you end up seeing all these effects. And you've seen that much more in Europe than you have in the US uh, because Europe just has much more uh, renewable power and also have done it probably worse, I, I would say, but mostly simply because you can't have a lot of solar or a lot of wind without much, much more battery. So when you're talking about batteries, they're trivial and they will still be trivial by 2040. Now, if we can get much more uh, batteries. So uh, the IEA has done, so the International Energy Agency has done a big study, uh, especially in India, because India has some of the best solar, not surprisingly, they're right uh, you know, the, at the equator. Uh, and they could actually have a situation where they have so much battery that they will start not putting up new coal-fired power plants after 2030. That'd be wonderful. It cut a full percent of emissions uh, towards 2040 but it's not going to solve everything. It's going to solve a bit, a bit part. And yes, we be, should be spending a lot more money on this, uh, but we need to get a, a sense of, 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 of size of this issue. And you know, just to give you, uh, just sorry, wrap this up. Um, if you look at solar, once you have 15% of solar, uh, for instance, in California, the price drops by two thirds. Uh, once you have about 13, 30% uh, of wind, the price drops more than 50%, which is why when people tell you it's uh, uh, competitive, it's only competitive if you don't think about the fact that you have lots of others uh, already running. So yes, we should have a little bit of solar and wind, but once you start having a lot of solar and wind, you're basically disrupting the whole energy system. That's why you end up with much higher cost and without much, much more storage. We're talking about storage that would you know, run into months, uh, which is right now and certainly in the next decades, almost fantastical to imagine that that would happen even if prices drop dramatically, as we're hoping they will. And we're hoping that R&D will make them drop even more, even faster. Thank you, Bjorn. Uh, and uh, so let's uh, turn to a couple of uh, audience questions. Uh, uh, there's a sort of a, a symmetrical questions for both of you. Uh, let's start with you, Bjorn. Uh, the challenge is this. Uh, you were speaking in terms of dollars and GDP, and the impression from the audience is Jeff is speaking in terms of human lives, that human lives are being threatened uh, even as we speak by all of the things that he listed, uh, the Himalayas, uh, acidification, all of that. And so could you change your metric for the moment and say, what's, what, what's it, what's it going to save in terms of human life to do what Jeff proposes? And I guess what might it cost in human life to do what Jeff, Jeff proposes? Yes, uh, there's, uh, because we only had 17 and a half minutes, I've cut back a lot of slides I would love to show. So now I'm just going to have to tell you and you have to take me on this. I'll, I'll tweet this afterwards. Uh, so if you look at the last hundred years, uh, the number of people have died from climate related disasters, that's floods, droughts, uh, uh, storms, uh, extreme temperatures. Uh, it's dropped precipitously. It's actually dropped is that the right word? Precipitously? Yes, yes, yes. Good. Thank you. Sometimes I worry that that meant pre precipitation. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so it's dropped 95%. And since we've at the same uh, 100 years quadruple global population, the individual risk of dying from climate related disasters has dropped by 99%. So uh, I actually showed you graphs of human life. So I showed you what are the biggest uh, 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 environmental problems that kill the most humans. Clearly, many, many other problems, especially indoor, outdoor air pollution and, and water and sanitation kills many more people than global warming does. Uh, but also it's very likely that the things that Jeff worries about that we're going to see uh, more extreme storms. Uh, uh, so just to give you a, a sense of that, the UN estimate will probably see fewer storms, but we'll see more violent storms and violent storms are worse than fewer of them. So overall we'll have bigger impacts. So Jeff is right that this is going to be a bigger problem, but it'll actually kill many fewer people 
because we'll get much richer and we'll be better able to adapt. So the real answer here is to say, this is the world where we used to see about half a million people die from climate-related disasters. Today, we see about 20,000 people die globally from climate-related disasters. In the future, we'll probably see many fewer. We'll maybe see, say, 5,000. But had we not had global warming or had we had Jeff's projection of uh, uh, a policy institute, we might see 4,000 or 3,000 people. And honestly, I'm making up these numbers because we don't have data because they're so small. But that order of magnitude, we'd save a few thousand people. But the cost would come in terms of especially poor people, but that's both poor people in rich countries and poor people in poor countries who would have less access to more expensive and less reliable energy. That would have much greater healthcare costs. Very clearly, it has costs when you both have uh, heating and cooling, which is one of the big killers of, of, of humans around the world, we estimate probably in the order of 10% of all deaths are due to heat and cold deaths. Most of them are cold deaths, actually. And we know that when people have to pay more to heat their homes, they heat them worse. And so more people will die. It is very likely, and I can't give the, the exact numbers, but it's very likely that orders of magnitude, so 10, 100, maybe even 1,000 times more people would die from these policies than would be saved from them from not having uh, climate-related disasters. Jeff, could you comment on uh, Bjorn's response? So I, I will say this. It, 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 we're, the, the problem here is that what we're talking about is what's happened in the past versus what might happen in the very near future. Again, the reason why I wrote the book, uh, whether folks want to agree with it or not, I hope they at least, you know, take a look at it, check out the citations, is that I'm arguing that these impacts are here now, right now, not 50 years from now. Because one of the big arguments that you hear now for those who are arguing for the status quo is let's just wait and see how bad it gets. Um, and I, which the truth is, if, these, if there is a tail risk and if these, as I believe, are going to be significant costs to society, to human life across the board, um, we can't wait 50 years to see how bad it's going to get. It's going to be significantly much worse 50 years from now. So that's why acting now is important. So I, I believe it's a bit of a red herring to talk about, well, things haven't happened in the past. You know, it, it's true. Nobody's migrated from Bangladesh because Bangladesh is not underwater. So there are no climate uh, related problems. Uh, but if Bangladesh goes underwater and they have to go somewhere, then there are going to be all sorts of impacts. Yemen's another good example. I really dug into Yemen as a very perfect example of um, the climate scientists said, because it's in the subtropics, because we're seeing climate impacts now, that water scarcity is an issue right now. It's only going to get worse in the very, very near future. It's going to dry up these wells. That's exactly what happened in Yemen. And the warlords took control after 14 of the 16 aquifers went dry, took control of the remaining two, created this internal strife. It led to a, a great deal of loss of human life um, and a great deal of suffering in Yemen. You can see this play out across the board. The same thing is happening in the cell. You can make a very clear case that because the climate impacts are happening right now, again, not 100% you know, responsible, but this whipsaw uh, interlocking uh, impacts is driving things uh, even like the creation of terrorism in some of these countries. So there is a great deal of impact on human life, but I, I, my main response is that um, just looking backwards um, to, a, to climate impacts that, that aren't yet happening is, is, a, is an unfair comparison to what's going to happen. This water already what's happening now, but is going to happen in the very near future, not 50 years from now. Okay. Can I just say some very, very okay. quickly? All right, go ahead. Go ahead Sorry, ahead. so just Jeff, if you're saying this is happening right now, we have the data. We know that there used to be half a million people dying from climate-related disasters 100 years ago. Now there's 20,000 people dying from climate-related disasters. This is not something we can have an opinion on. This is simply true, that the risk has reduced 99%, and it's kept reducing since the 1980s as well. So look, there's just, you know, if you're going to say it's right now, you're just wrong. Now, you can say that in the near future, something bad is going to happen and that the past is not a good example for, for the future. And, you know, th that's a fair argument. But I think the models very clearly tell us that that's not going to happen either. You want to respond, Jeff, or you want to wait for the next question? Well, uh, uh, that's fine. I mean, I, uh, I'm not wrong. Uh, that they, There are impacts <laughs> right now. I mean, that's, those are nice statistics you've thrown out there. But clearly, um, we see climate impacts right now. I mean, I could go. Th I'll, just, I'll just give you one example. 
I mean, the fact that half of all species are experiencing local extinctions, that is as big a canary in a coal mine as you're going to see. And I, I interviewed Terry Root for my book, who is the preeminent biodiversity expert in the country. She's beside herself that nobody quite understands what is happening to species on earth. It, the human species is just one of hundreds of thousands of species. But the fact that we're seeing that occur right now means something. That is a big statistic, not a small one. That is a very large statistic. So to say that I'm wrong, that impacts are happening now, I would argue that's, you know, that's not correct. They are happening now. And every, that's, that's why, that's why um, the thousands of climate scientists who look, you know, talk about, you know, multiple levels to describe the, the climate uh, fingerprint and the climate impacts they're, they, they've, they, they've, they've anticipated and now they're seeing it. Question for uh, Bjorn. Uh, Jeff mentioned uh, another Nobel Prize winner, Joseph Stiglitz, who takes a different position on costs and benefits of uh, Jeff's proposals uh, from the other Nobel Prize winner you mentioned. Uh, uh, could you respond to uh, Jeff's point about the alternative measures that Joseph Stiglitz has associated himself with, Bjorn. Yeah, so I mean, uh, <laughs> two points. First of all, uh, uh, Joe Stiglitz got his Nobel Prize in the uh, communication of uh, information in, in, in markets like used uh, cars. Uh, he did great work in that. He's not a climate economist. Nobel, uh, Nordhaus got his economics prize in climate economics. Uh, uh, I don't know all of, of uh, Joe Stiglitz's work, but I do know the, uh, the, uh, the work that Jeff uh, mentioned. Uh, and uh, he did that work together with Nicholas Stern. What they showed was, and I think Jeff also correctly mentioned it, was that a carbon price can actually manage a transition to a lower carbon economy at a reasonable price. That's absolutely true. There's no one who would deny that you can do this at a reasonable price, especially if you get to def decide yourself what is reasonable. Uh, but clearly you can have a reasonable transition. So, you know, if you go for the 80% below to uh, 1990 levels as the EU did, uh, you can probably do it for 5%. That's, that's doable, that's reasonable. Uh, I think a lot of people would still think it's way too expensive. And as I pointed out, I think most voters are gonna say no to that way before that happens. But they did not show that this was a good investment of money. And I think it goes to the whole point of, of uh, Jeff's, uh, Jeff's argument. Uh, I think Jeff slightly skewed or sort of slid away from his answer and started talking about a lot of other species. I was simply making the point about we have good statistics for humans and you're saying it has impacts on humans right now and it doesn't in, in those statistics. Uh, but, 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 the, but the main point here remains that the question is what would have happened for instance, in Yemen and other places, had we made an enormous climate policy back in, say, 1980 or 1990, 1992, when, when we first promised, had the whole world stopped using climate uh, 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 fossil fuels, what would have happened? Well, very little. We know it would have had very, very tiny impact on the temperatures for Yemen in the 2010s. It would, however, have made every country in the world much, much poor, including, of course, making many hundreds of millions of people uh, uh, keeping them in poverty. So the real question here is not, would I love to be able to snap my fingers and make climate change go away? Yes, I would love that. Because yes, Jeff is right, climate change is a problem. The real question is, of course, outside this sort of uh, wishful thinking, is we have to pay a price for a climate policy to get a benefit and the question is, how big is the cost? How big is the benefit? And Joe Stiglitz and Nicholas Stern did not do that uh, calculation. And I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not very surprised they didn't do it because they know what the answer is. There's been lots of people doing lots of those estimates uh, over the last couple of years, sorry, over the last couple of decades. And they've all found the same thing. We should do some, but not a lot. Uh, do you want to respond to, to uh, uh, Bjorn's answer, Jeff? Well, no, I don't think so because I, 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 okay, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to answer for Joe Stiglitz. I mean, I think he um, defends himself quite well. I think he's actually written uh, about some of this, about your book, Bjorn, in the New York Times. So I think he answers this for himself. Uh, and I've characterized it somewhat here, here in this discussion. Uh, question for Jeff then. Uh, 
the, the audience is characterizing your argument, Jeff, as a little bit ambivalent as to whether you think that uh, that conversion from fossil fuels to clean energy is so efficient that it's going to happen anyway, versus uh, the opposite idea that it might not happen anyway, but policymakers have got to make it happen, force it to happen, because unless they force it to happen, it won't happen. So could you clarify your position with respect to those two different approaches? Yeah, I will. And I'll, and I'll say it's a, it, that's a really good question. I, I, I believe this, it will be a messy transition. Uh, and I'm going to use the transition on the internet as a good example. I, and, and, and I think this will be, I, I hope this will be helpful for the audience. Uh, again, I worked at the National Science Foundation when there was a thing called the World Wide Web long before anybody knew what it was. Uh, the Pentagon was running supercomputers. They, they handed off things called pops. They handed off things, you know, uh, you know, that, that could create this interconnected thing, uh, you know, the World Wide Web long before there was the internet. Well, the National Science, Science Foundation placed a big bet. They bet a big part of their budget to connect every university in the United States and then on the planet to connect all these pots to basically build the architecture of the internet. So there was a big bet. That was a policy. That was a political decision by Congress. Actually, Al Gore was involved in that. He was the re he reauthorized the National Science Foundation specifically to build that architecture. So there is there are policy drivers. There are political drivers. There are financial incentives. There are public incentives, and I believe the same thing's going to happen here. Uh, it's true, it, as Bjorn has noted. I. I, I did focus very heavily on um, where private financial groups are going. I didn't focus as much on public drivers like the Paris Climate Agreement, like nationally determined um, uh, 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 carbon dioxide levels for 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 countries. IDCs. Under Paris climate, IP, you know, the NDCs under the Paris Climate Agreement. I didn't focus on the public side of the equation. There's going to be, have to be both. The reason why I, fo I wanted to focus on the private sector side of the equation is because I really believe you're seeing a very clear signal right now from financial and analysts who see both climate risk and opportunity from big business CEOs who are clearly, I mean, if you look at the big tech companies, they're clearly trying to get, they're competing with each other to get to 100% renewable energy in their supply chains and you know, by 2030. They're doing that for a reason. They're under pressure, both from the public side and the private side. So um, I think ambivalence probably the wrong word to describe what I'm trying to articulate. I'm focusing on the private sector. I'm focusing on private uh, financial analysis. But I do believe absolutely there may there has to be a public component to it. It can be regulatory. It can be uh, political. It can be policy oriented. Um, and honestly, it's probably going to be a bit messy, just like the transition to the internet was a big, a bit messy. Go back to what I said about the New York Times had an opportunity once upon a time early on to buy 25% of Google. Their answer was Google. What's the internet? That's not a. That's not going to compete against me. Um, and, and so, so, so they said no. I think the same thing is going on right now. Some are placing big bets on a future that I believe is going to be here much sooner than people realize. Jordan, you want to comment on Jeff's response? So, um, well, I mean, the private sector is mostly in uh, uh, on this because it is PR. You mentioned that uh, most of the big tech companies want to go to 100% by 2030. Well, that's because they mostly emit fairly little CO2. It's easy to do when you have little uh, uh, emissions. Uh, Sky in Europe was the first uh, 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 big corporation in Europe to go uh, carbon neutral. That's because they basically just have a few PCs that they had to offset. Uh, so it's very, very easy when you're small companies. Most of these private companies do it because it's profitable for them, because they're gonna get lots and lots of money that's gonna be handed out by a lot of different programs to a lot of different policies. But let's not for one second presuppose that that's going to fix global warming. Their global warming is at heart a public problem. It's a problem where putting out CO2 creates problems that have nothing to do with me. 
It has everything to do with everyone else, which is why you need public regulation for it. That's also why, unless you get public regulation, you're never going to attack very much of the problem. So I think in some way, it's, it's a little disturbing uh, if, uh, Jeff, if you, if you almost entirely focused on the private bit, because this is going to be about all of us. This is about the Paris Agreement and how we're going to do both as individual nations and certainly as, as a global community. Oh. And that's where our, in our, our experience has been, we have constantly been promising stuff and not living up to it. Uh, we promised in Rio in 1992, didn't live up to it. In Kyoto, most didn't live up to it. The only reason why some did was because of the financial crisis. Uh, and now we promised in Paris, and even if everybody does what they promise, it will have a minimal impact on temperatures. So we're still far, far away from what we need to do. And that's why I'm arguing that the, uh, that the uh, studies clearly show this is going to be very, very expensive. All right, we have a, a, a time for like one final question, I guess, Lob, to you, Bjorn. Uh, uh, Jeff has mentioned a few times uh, the idea of tail risk, and your instance is interpreting that to mean that there's some, you know, one in a thousand chance likelihood or something like that of a true disaster. Do you acknowledge that risk? And if so, what do you propose doing about it? Yes. So uh, it's actually a good argument. And I think it is the best argument for making uh, bigger investments. So Nordhaus and many others have looked at this, and it does increase the amount of investment that we should put in, in climate policy. Uh, one of the things that I try to work with in my organization, uh, since Jeff has been uh, uh, flaunting his book, I guess I should also just mention that I have a new book out. Uh, and you should take a look at that. Uh, but, uh, but what I mostly actually do uh, is, is focusing on, on uh, looking across all the different areas. So with my think tank, the Copenhagen Consensus, uh, we look at all the different investments that you can do in the world. So should you be investing in nutrition or in education or in healthcare or in global warming or in, uh, uh, or in air pollution and, and gender equality and all these other challenges that the world faces. And I think one of the problems that we have when we talk about existential risk is if you look out till 2100, almost every policy that you can imagine can have a potential existential risk. All you need is to say there's a non-zero risk of if we choose this, this uh, if we go down this route, it'll open up, you know, say if we don't tackle HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's going to make some African countries collapse. You're going to get terrorism, throw in bio, uh, 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 terrorism, throw in, you know, the ability to make viruses and wham, bam, you have uh, the death of everyone before 2100. Again, it's not uh, given it may even be a very, very small risk, but it's a non-zero risk. And so we should be spending more money here. The problem with the argument of tail risk is if everything has tail risk, you really have to ask, how do we handle these different issues? And I like to just uh, very briefly say, we, we actually have a good estimate. Uh, because back in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, we started realizing that you know, asteroids could hit the earth. We, we've always known, but, you know, people started realizing we could actually figure that out. And the U.S. Congress asked NASA to find 90% of all these uh, asteroids that could hit earth. Uh, NASA had also provided a budget for finding 99% of them, but Congress felt that that was too costly. So there we have it. You actually have a very clear estimate of how much we're willing to spend extra on safeguarding us against the next 9% of tail risk? And the answer is not very much. And I think that's also what we see generally across history. We have tail risks everywhere we look. We cannot afford to worry about each and every one of them. Of course, every single participant who is just arguing for their particular issue will say, tail risk, give me more money. But overall, we have to recognize that there are tail risks everywhere, not just in global warming. Jeff, I, we, we are out of time for the Q&A. Please, uh, roll, if you want to respond to, to what uh, Bjorn just said, roll that into your final summation. We'll have seven and a half minutes for that. We have to go to that part of it. So, uh, Jeff, uh, for the final summation, would you take it away? Great. And I'll just say that was, a, that was a, I enjoyed listening to that discussion about tail risk. So, um, uh, it, it, it tail risk is was just one of those very diff. I mean, insurance companies take a look at tail risk, you know, financial an analysts who have to manage vast sums of money, look at tail risk. Uh, so um, it, it's certainly a valid question. I, so let me just try to sum up this way. I, if I can, I don't have a prepare. I just want to sort of go through sort of where we've had the discussion first. 
I would argue that the Paris Climate Agreement, because my organization, we were there, we were there every single day. We, we held like 24 press conferences over a 12 day period in Paris. The Paris Climate Agreement was a breakthrough moment for the world. Uh, Rio, Copenhagen, all the, Kyoto, all those things that Bjorn talks about, it's true. They, they didn't get a whole lot done. There was a lot of talk. That was not the case for the Paris Climate Agreement. The Paris Climate Agreement changed everything. When you have every single country in the world, rich and poor, um, coming together saying, we are going to take this issue seriously. We're going to get this done. We're going to figure out a way between public and private sector. That was a big deal. So, I, so um, that's why things have changed. Um, and I will say in the United States, I, it's interesting, Bjorn talks about um, there isn't this public will to deal with this. That's not the case in the United States. Climate change for the Democratic Party, for Democratic voters in the United States, is it is now their top issue. You saw it very clearly. We had, we had climate change questions for both presidential debates and the vice presidential debate. It was the one issue that dominated uh, across all three it is a very big deal in the United States as an issue. It's at the bottom of the list for the Republican Party for multiple reasons. And this is from somebody, I worked in a Republican administration. I was Dan Quayle's communications director in a Republican White House. I was a Republican political appointee at the FDA, a science-based agency. I also worked at the National Science Foundation in a Republican administration. Um, and it has always bothered me immensely that the Republican Party has not dealt with this issue from a science basis. So that continues to bother me. But I will tell you, it is absolutely a paramount concern in the United States. There is massive public support for clean renewable energy and for a transition. Whether we want to argue about whether it's going to take 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, the public would like to see it. They'd like to see jobs as many as possible. That's why I mentioned this Rewiring America um, study that showed quite clearly there are millions of new jobs waiting to happen. Um, it's because there is a pent up demand for this. Um, I, I would say, and I would say, at least in the United States, and, and it could be around the world, it's a bipartisan approach. People want to see this transition, and they'd actually like to see it sooner rather than later. It's one of the reasons I would argue that virtually every analyst says that clean energy, a clean energy economy is the next big thing. Um, if, if, if you look, I mean, most people think that the global economy may not um, see bet. dramatic growth, yeah. thank you, may not see dramatic growth um, uh, absent this clean energy revolution. So yes, I know I'm focusing on the private sector. I'm happy to talk about the public sector, which I will in just a second. Um, but but why not bet on that future? Why not? I mean, just as some people said, let's bet on a technology revolution and a technology driven global economy. Why not bet on this clean energy uh, revolution as well? And on the corporate sector, yes, I, I, I hear you Bjorn when you say they look like it's, it's done for public relations purposes. It, it may be done because they don't have necessarily an outsized footprint. But I will say this, when virtually every Fortune 1000 CEO gets in the game and just puts their company's reputation behind it, at some point, and I hope certainly much sooner than later, those commitments by those corporate leaders translate into real meaningful action across the board. When you see Facebook and Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Unilever uh, and Salesforce competing to get to 2030 targets, um, they could just as easily provide net zero by 2050 targets. They're not doing that. They're saying it'll be by 2030. I would argue that's going to translate um, into a global economic opportunity probably within a decade. Um, then on the public sector side, and I can speak mostly to the United States because I have a great deal of experience in the political sector. I'll predict right now in 2021, I guess we'll see what happens with the elections in, in two weeks, but. I believe there's going to be a massive public sector approach to dealing with this issue. Um, uh, it could come in the form, it could come in one of three forms. It could come in the form of uh, a multi-trillion dollar economic recovery package that, that creates conservation cores and, and, and rebuilds things and puts together infrastructure, but also infrastructure on, on the financial side of the equation. That's a public sector driver. I believe you'll see um, the first serious effort for a big climate uh, bill. I, I just interviewed the chairman of the House Select Committee on Climate. I've talked to Senate Democrats. Um, they're prepared to move on the public sector side of the equation finally after years of not being able to do so. Um, and I think there also is going to be across the administration, if, it, if Joe Biden does win the election, um, there's a very good chance that across every single uh, public sector aspect of the federal government, they're going to do something both on the climate um, emission side of the equation, but also on the, the clean energy revolution side of the equation. Um, I also wanted to talk very briefly and then close with this, that um, 
we talked earlier in this discussion about rich versus poor action among rich versus poor. And it's true that if the rich countries, they can't solve this problem. Yemen couldn't solve the problem if had they taken. And I think that's a bit of a red herring to talk about if, if you saw, you know, Yemen couldn't solve the climate problem, but if the world solves the climate problem, if water scarcity was not an issue in Yemen, then there's a then there's every chance that you don't see some of those societal problems there. That's the point here, that this is a global public commons problem, that the global economy needs to respond to it, the countries and the leaders and the business leaders need to respond to it. And I do believe, it, yes, it's in China's best interest because they don't want, they lost the technology race. They do not intend to lose, lose the clean energy race. I can guarantee you that that's part of what's driving them. And if China acts and they act meaningfully, that will have an impact. Likewise in India, I, I, I've talked to the leadership of the Rockefeller Foundation that's, that's, that's betting on a microgrid solution that will help um, the energy poor in India. I think, I, I, I believe India is going to get there. They would love to see um, a clean energy, a cheap clean energy solution, because they that's that's what's going to get to those three, four hundred million people who don't have power right now. They would love to see that. And I actually genuinely believe they will they will they will get there and that will help with that problem. And then I'll just close with this. I one minute, I, yeah. I, I will I what I've been arguing here is that we have public will, we have financial interest, we have um, human interest, finally, after so many years of looking at st raw statistics and questions about policy, we're starting to see human beings interested in this. And I'll just leave you with one discussion. This is in the United States. There are, there are victims in 20 states that have banded together called Higher Ground who have, who, who have lost their homes or lost property from flooding that's driven by climate change. Um, and we, we could talk about the science behind this and the climate science behind it. And, and so I'm just gonna put it out there as a given, climate change is, 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 is now intersecting with this. And so you have human interest people. You see people in Houston who are worried about the flooding that swept through the city. You're seeing wildfires and we can, you know, this is a climate science uh, question, but you know, wildfires are bigger and hotter. Um, and it's one of the reasons why it's, almost, it's becoming very hard to ensure things in California. You're seeing human interest in this story. So the combination of all of those things uh, leaves me convinced that the world, um, thanks to the Paris Climate Agreement and others is going to act. So thank you. And thank you for, for, the, for the opportunity to, to hold this discussion. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, and uh, Bjorn, seven and a half minutes for rebuttal. For, for summary, excuse me. Well, yes, I think it's more going to be a summary. So, uh, yes, Jeff, thank you very much for this conversation. Uh, I, I think the way that we've been framed this is, is very much uh, sort of leading up to whether you should vote yes or no uh, to this proposition. Uh, so so I, I think we need to get a sense, again, of proportion. So uh, Jeff is very upbeat. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I was, I was at Paris as well. I didn't hold as many press conferences as you did, clearly. Uh, but I think we also got to be honest and say, yes, countries made a lot of noise. There was a lot of reporting there. But even if all countries live up to all of their promises, it'll have a minuscule impact on temperatures even 80 years from now. Now, if they kept those promises and kept them for the rest of their century, it would reduce temperatures by 0 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit. That's very little. And of course, no major partner is actually poised to keep their current promises, let alone the bigger promises that they're now going to be rattling off. Climate policy has constantly been about making grand promises and then not keeping them. And I question whether that's the best way to leave our kids. Uh, you know, so instead of giving them a college education, as you were talking about, we'll just promise them stuff and not give it to them. I think that's probably one of the worst ways that we can deal with the climate problem or indeed any other problem. And so it gets back to saying, is the right way to do this? Is that to promise not just what we've already done and is not keeping, not just more, than what we've already promised, but an absurd amount, namely, let's go carbon neutral in 20 years. Something that we know is not gonna happen. Something we know is gonna be phenomenally costly. Something we know is gonna be much, much costlier than the benefit it'll derive. Plus, at the same time, it will take away attention from all the things that will help, both with climate, so adaptation, carbon tax, and certainly a lot of innovation, and also all the other issues in the world. So Jeff also talks about there's massive support. 
And yes, you're right. If you ask people very sort of shallowly, do you want us to do something about climate change? They'll say yes. If you ask them, is this a really big crisis? They'll say, yes, it is a really big crisis. They'll also say lots of other things are big crises. crises. Uh, but if you then ask them, are you willing to pay for it? Most people are only willing to pay a couple hundred bucks for this. As I mentioned, the, uh, the Washington Post, $24. But you can get other uh, you know, surveys that will show that people are willing to pay a couple hundred dollars for it. Five if minutes. you're then proposing the – sorry? Five minutes to go, yeah. yeah. Five minutes, yeah. Five minutes. Okay, good. If you're then proposing to people that you're going to pay $1,500 per year per person, which is just the, you know, the Biden uh, proposal, the trillion dollars of you know, his $2 trillion over four years, uh, and that's just you know, simple uh, uh, math, you're going to get people upset. People are not willing to spend that much more money. You're saying that it'll ge generate more jobs, that it'll generate more uh, uh, opportunity. But the reality is, of course, if you are getting, and you know, I'm just using the official statistics, if you can get solar energy and employ 39 people from solar energy for every time you can employ one person with gas, you've got to realize that that's not a great thing. That means 38 people are working not on something else, not on educating your kids, not on taking care of your kids in kindergarten or taking care of your elderly or making better health care or making better infrastructure and all the other things that we also need people for. Using people to make incredibly unproductive work is not a great idea. Uh, the, the, the famous skit is, you know, when, uh, when you're in, uh, in, in China and they're working, uh, just digging, uh, digging with shovels, uh, when, 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 you, when people claim, well, that generally more jobs, then the obvious answer is, well, why don't they just use teaspoons if that's what you're trying to do? But of course, the reality is we're actually trying to make people more productive so that we have better opportunities. So again, when you say that clean energy could be the new thing of the 21st century, I think this is fundamentally wrong. And for a very simple reason, we alluded to that before. If you get the clean energy revolution just right, nobody's going to be able to tell the difference. Because you'll just get clean power now out of your socket before when you before got not clean energy out of your socket. But it'll feel the exact same way. There's no way to get people excited about this. Google provided new uh, opportunities. All technologies in the past have provided new opportunities. The only thing that will drive this is either a lot of money spent on political uh, hold or that we get innovations that just simply makes it cheaper than fossil fuels. I argue that we should be focusing on making it cheaper because that's the only way, way that we're gonna succeed in getting the uh, clean energy revolution. But we should not allow ourselves to believe that this is gonna be easy and certainly not that this is gonna be cheap. And so that comes back to saying, we can have this conversation and you rightly say this is a big issue in, in the US and it's also a big issue in Europe. But the issue here is, how do we get people along with us to actually accept that we're going to be spending, you know, five or 10% of GDP? I don't think you can do that. And I think that's why we need to recognize instead of trying to essentially curt with the yellow vest, as we saw in France, when, uh, when Macron imposed a carbon tax that's equivalent to 13 cents in the gallon of, of gasoline, and you basically get the country rioting for half a year, we need to find a way that allows us to solve global warming within the budget frame of what most people say they're willing to pay, not by making trillion dollar deals that will not be sustainable in the long run. And quite frankly, if Corona's taught us anything, it is that we've pretty much run out of money now. We're not gonna be able to also support a huge and subsidy hungry uh, green energy reform. So. Uh, you, you talk about that we have public will, we have private will, we have human interest. Well, we have human interest as long as it doesn't cost very much. We have private will as long as we get lots of money from the public. Uh, and the public will, I think, thank you, the public will is really just a question of how much money are we willing to spend. I would argue we can spend a little and we should spend it smartly. I think, Jeff, and I'm sorry, I'm now going to characterize you, especially because you can't come back at me. But, but I think Jeff's proposal is basically say, let's spend lots and lots of money badly on not fixing this problem very well. And that's why I'm arguing 
we should really say no to this proposition. It doesn't mean say no to climate policy. It means let's say yes to smart climate policy, unlike just saying, let's all go carbon neutral in 20 years, which is just not going to happen. It's going to be phenomenally costly and unfortunately going to derail our conversations about real impacts for climate and all the other things that we also need to tackle. But again, thank you very much, Jeff. It was, I think it was a great conversation. I'm sorry okay. it's a slightly sort of a, this confrontorial uh, conversation at the same time. Thanks for your apology, Bjorn, and uh, thanks uh, for your contribution to what is a clash of views. It's not an attack on individuals. It's not, you guys have been uh, marvelously polite to each other, which is quite appropriate. No ad hominems. You uh, disagree with each other. And that's what the audience wanted to hear, the, the clash of views between you. And I commend you, Jeff, and I commend you, Bjorn, on uh, meeting that challenge both. The uh, resolution, of course, reads, to, to combat climate change, the world's leaders must make it their highest priority to completely replace the burning of fossil fuels within the next 20 years. Uh, well, all right, uh, Jeff, you began with 13.33% of the, of the vote. So yes, the yes vote got 13.33% and you held at 13.33%. So you kept your position, <laughs> but you didn't add. Uh, uh, Bjorn began with 60% of the vote, went up to 86.67% for a gain of 26 points. Uh, Bjorn, it looks as though you win the Tootsie Roll. And uh, so congratulations to you, Bjorn. Thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, Jeff, I want to tell you, Bjorn, English is not Bjorn's first language, so he was at a little bit of a disadvantage, uh, but uh, he did very well in English. Jeff, you did as well. Thank you to you both. And, uh, and good night to all. Thanks very much. Good night. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks, Jeff. You, your English is really good, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> it better be. I've had plenty of practice. So. <laughs> you're, 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 you fall off a, a precipice. A, a precipice. <laughs> that word you stumbled on, Bjorn. If you fall off a precipice, you fall violently. That's where precipitous comes from. That, yes. Right. Okay. Great. Okay. But good English. Thanks. Very good English, Bjorn. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.